country. We covered significantly U.S. politics, what to look out for, what is playing in regards to, of course, the interest rate decision and the fight against inflation. Covered, of course, our NFP data, CPI data, what it means and its correlation to the indices in the market like Nasdaq and Dow Jones what sectors to look out for in the coming year that would be the drivers or the detractors to price action. We covered significantly what is going on in the oil market, the oil price was between and production was between the OPEC and of course the non-OPEC countries. And uh, we covered significantly what is happening in the European economy and uh, the outlook for the European currency pairs and obviously some of the opportunities that you can plan to capitalize on in 2024 Enjoy. Hello, December. How are you doing, Rufus? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Ah, December is December. Okay. A lot of activities left, right, and center. Office party? Um, Unfortunately, I was... uh, away yeah but you know wherever i was it was still december yeah you know they normally say that uh in december this is when you walk out to buy bread and come back next week i hate to admit it (laughs) 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 once or twice back in the years but this year i said uh, i will count the number of weekends in the year plan my finances accordingly yeah because one thing for sure the cost of living is not coming down so that mistake or risk of waking up and going anywhere is not really something you would be happy doing, knowing the way that everything is literally skyrocketing it, skyrocketing in price. You know, of course you'd you'd be happy for the moment, but uh, yeah, come January, yeah, is when it all comes crashing down on you. Yeah, and you do that by the end of the year, your account will be crying like those KPLC tokens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are recording this after Jamuhuri Day. Uh, I don't know where the electricity, you know, darkness found you. Yeah, I was at home. Uh-huh. Uh, I remember I had a couple of tasks to complete. Yeah. So on uh, trying to reach out to friends where I normally move around when there's no electricity. Yeah, definitely. Just realized it's uh, countrywide and it was a sad, sad thing. Yeah especially now that it's becoming a trend. So for people like us who are heavily dependent on electricity, uh, for us to trade, we must have electricity. So if we don't have electricity, things get real bad. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. Yeah. After weeks of flood, basically the dams are full and being Kenya, one of the, you know, leading clean energy producers uh, that uh, our hydroelectric cannot let's say, cannot stabilize and, you know, be, be, be reliable, to say the least. Yes. Uh, just after it, because, you know, giving doesn't rain significantly, it means the dams are, you know, the water levels are reducing, the energy production is enough to sustain the economy for even a month without really demanding a lot from the one we import from ginger. Well, uh, I think from what we heard from the Minister of Energy, uh, Ministry of Energy CS, yeah, um, Kenya is producing some uh, sufficient amount of electricity. Yeah. Uh, with the biggest supplier being Kenjen. Uh, then on the demand side, it's uh, also really good. The problem is our uh, distribution. Mm. So uh, the problem we're experiencing in a country is where we have increased production, increased consumption, mm. but then the distribution network is uh, completely outdated. Yeah. So they were basically loading uh, a higher voltage on lines that were not supposed to carry that kind of voltage. Yeah. And as a result, uh, it led us to a blackout. I think this is where we bring in the concept of decentralization. Yes. Yeah, instead of uh, amassing all the you know power to one, let's say, channel, yeah. uh, decentralizing it into region which op- operate autonomously yes. and not really dependent on instructions from the above. Yeah. So that would really go a long way in ensuring that, uh, let's say, if you produce in Western Kenya, you supply in Western Kenya, you get your revenues in Western Kenya, and at least for the investors in KPLC, yeah. if they do that, yes. it would really improve efficiency because I don't know how they operate, but sometimes I tend to think they act, they look decentralized, yeah. but act, you know, in yeah. a single file. 
Yeah, it's a centralized institution. I remember last year yeah. during winter there was a a breakout happening in uh, the US in Texas. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, as a result of a hurricane. At the same time, there was a uh, extreme winter that had covered solar panels and yeah. uh, weed uh, weed turbines. Yeah. And as a result, it led to a breakout in Texas and a couple of other other states. Yeah. But the majority of the US was still having full electricity supply. So it makes more sense to either or, no, or uh, either decentralize or have different uh, segregations uh, within Kenya Power serving different regions. Or even product or, producers working independently. Yeah, or basically just allow for free open market so yeah. that anyone can get a license and supply electricity to any part of the country. Definitely. That would open up the competition and uh, lead to a healthier balance in the uh, energy supply. I uh, know. For our international listeners, uh, don't worry, you can compare the same to the ESCOM load shedding situation in uh, South Africa. Yeah. I think, uh, that is, those are some of the measures so perhaps they were suggesting to address that. Yeah, load shedding is not our thing. Uh, it should not be normalized. <laughs> it's, def- uh, it's really bad and uh, bad for investment. Yeah. Uh, basically, forces people to get uh, an alternative source of uh, energy. And that might go to either diesel or petrol generators, as well as uh, solar. And the moment a client goes solar, they don't come back to the grid. Definitely. So it wouldn't work very well, for, especially for Kenya Power investors. Definitely. Now, um, this was just after the NFP, uh, one of the major news. So the last uh, uh, significant piece of data that not only investors and traders would be looking at, at all, but also the Federal Reserve, which meets on 13th, that is today, um, of which we expect perhaps a, main, a continuation of the same rate hikes and maybe the same language. What was your make of the 199K as opposed to around less than, uh, you know, uh, 300K numbers that we were looking to see from the NFP? Well, um, I would say I was expecting a bigger number than expected. Oh, uh, really? Yes. This was mainly because of... Uh, two data points. Uh, one was the United Auto Workers, uh, UAW guys that have been uh, have been on strike for yeah. quite a period. So they basically resumed work in the previous one month in November. So that's a huge addition to the private sector. So besides that, there's the, the workers that had gone on strike in Hollywood and uh, they just recently resumed work after negotiations. Mm-hmm. So that's a big, big addition to the job market in the U.S. Okay. So in addition to that, there is uh, what you call the temporary hiring that normally happens during the three days. And uh, these three days are basically the Thanksgiving Day uh, holiday. Uh, we have Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So on those uh, three days, retail uh, purchases tend to be at an all-time high. So in that case, you find a lot of retail chains hiring out of people across the uh, value chain. This expands to people serving in distribution, mm. service sector, and so on. So I expected the number to jump higher. Okay. But the, uh, also, I, I remember things, one of the data points that came out of Thanksgiving was that uh, uh, most of the airports were the busiest ever yes. due to travels in and out. So there is that. Maybe I think... As much as jobs might be added, I don't think it has uh, the the higher risk, for example, yeah. have the financial capacity yeah. to bring on what they missed. I think if they were to do it, they would do it gradually, yeah. not all of them. Those who are let go, unfortunately, that happened. Yeah. For the rest, they'll be doing it on a step-by-step situ- scenario until, let's say, it reaches that threshold where you'd say, Okay, this is enough to make sure that our productions are going online and are, are at least within the target. I think that is what I would uh, I would say or see from that numbers. Uh, in regards to, of course, its impact in the markets, uh, I don't know, did you expect the gold, rather the dollar, to continue to strengthen? Well, uh, that was quite surprising. Uh, one thing has been clear. In mm. the last couple of months, uh, the U.S. Fed Chair, Jerome Powell, has been maintaining the same message, yeah. saying that uh, he's looking to keep uh, rates higher for longer. And uh, this is uh, largely data dependent, so they're also following the data to make any necessary policy adjustments. Mm-hmm. But then the goal is to keep the interest rates at a restrictive level for long 
enough period of time until inflation gets back to the target, which he insisted is not changing at 2%. So uh, we have seen inflation drop to 3.0%, rally to 3.2%, then 3.7%, and then drop all the way back down to 3.1%. But then this has not hit the target yet, which is 2.0%, which means that the Fed might be a little bit more resilient in holding rates higher for longer uh, compared to what the markets are anticipating. Okay. So as of today, uh, before the FOMC press conference, uh, we have an estimated 98.4% probability that the Fed will hold rates at the current level, that is uh, within the range of 5.25% and 5.50%. However, if you look forward, you notice that uh, Fed funds futures, that is the 30-day Fed funds futures, mm -hmm. are basically pricing in another 94% probability that in the January Fed meeting, it will still hold rates at the current level of 5.25 to 5.50. So the most interesting data point now moves to March. So at least in March, we have a, a probability of uh, some form of change. And uh, this means that uh, there is a potential that the Fed will start cutting rates in March. Okay. So the probability is there are still uh, almost 50%. So once we get to around 50% and higher, then it starts making sense. Now, I will link that with the CPI data that came out a few days ago. Yes. Uh, based on the NF, not a few days ago, but rather 12th of December, yeah. yesterday, yeah. as of recording. Yeah. One of the key data sets that uh, I think uh, the Fed has been looking at yeah. has been the hourly earnings yeah. of uh, those who at least, uh, or, or wages basically, yeah. for those who get onto NFP. Yeah. And, uh, that, uh, and uh, if, you, if you tie it out, tie it up to the CPI data that came out, yes. it came out sort of as expected yeah. with the fuel not contributing significantly, yeah. but the services sector was quite expensive. Uh, rather, uh, co uh, the services has, was one of the drivers of, yeah. of, of, of inflation. Yeah. And if I look at those two together, as you have said, we are expecting a lot of, you know, because these guys were on strike, like, uh, you know, Auto, auto workers, yeah. all your doctors, they got, I think, 25% bump on their income. Yeah. So that definitely means people are getting a lot of money maybe to spend out there. Yes. And obviously, if you get a bump, the first point typically is to spend a little yes. and then bring in rationale as well. Yes. So I, I think uh, from what I'm seeing or what, what I observe from the CPI data, yeah. including what the Fed is doing, they will be inclined to maintain the rates and that will mean that uh, maybe... Uh, investors should look at uh, not focusing when the Fed will start cutting it down, yeah. but rather um, what is the economy saying? Yeah. Because if you look at at it based on the numbers, the yeah. people getting jobs are now starting to decline. The yes. NFP number is starting to look negative. Yeah. And if if uh, it goes the way we anticipate, we uh, let's say the textbook way, yeah. less people are getting employed. Yeah. Employed recession starts to be the topic of the of the conversation, which has been the case. Yeah. And the other good thing is that the bond yields are starting to come down. Ten year, I think, right now is trading at four point two, which is fairly okay. At yeah. least that will be a, another key driver to you know um, the Fed maybe holding on higher yeah. for longer. Yeah. Do you think maybe uh, as we close up the year? Uh, some of the drivers of a resilient economy from, you know, artificial intelligence to obviously proper earnings on the companies will be one of the things to look out for, at least in the Q1 of 2023? Well, uh, I think there's still one more meeting from uh, major central banks. Okay. Uh, this week we have four central banks that are announcing interest rate decisions. Uh -huh. So while we look at the Fed today, yeah. later in the week we'll be having the ECB, the Bank of England, and uh, the Swiss National Bank. So all of them are indicating a potential where they have uh, this approach where they decide to wait and see. Okay. So we have seen it happening with the Reserve Bank of Australia last week where they chose to hold rates at 4.35%. Uh, yeah. So I think they are the guiding principle. You remember the quote where we uh, normally say, don't fight the Fed. Yes. Yeah. So if, if the Fed is uh, has been consistent in its messaging and it's looking to hold rates at uh, that rate uh, higher for longer, then it basically means that we have to work within that policy environment. So while the markets, on the other hand, have been uh, ignoring and questioning the Fed, and uh, this is evident from uh, the 
recent rally that we have seen in the Nasdaq, yes. uh, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500. Just for reference, the S&P 500 is up 21.43% year to date. Uh, the Nasdaq is up over 50%, uh, to be specific, 50.55% year to date. Whereas the Dow Jones, which has been the slow one, is up 10.39%. So these are like a record, record performance uh, for the Nasdaq. Uh, it's not every day you see the Nasdaq being up 50%. So also another important fact to notice is that the Nasdaq is just 2.3% away from its all-time high. Which I believe it will be hit. Yes. The market has tended to beat all-time highs this year yeah. so many times uh, uh, that uh, you, you you have a better chance succeeding at it yeah. when the market, I believe by the time this poll will be coming out, yeah. we might have or we might be close to the to the all-time high. All-time high. Yeah, similar to the DAX. The German DAX is also approaching an all-time high. I guess it's safe to say yeah. my Santa Rally is not really missing out. <laughs> yeah, it's happening. It's happening in real time. Yes. So uh, the what, theory, the theory has been, uh, you know, yeah. proven. Yeah. What we are seeing here is an overly resilient U.S. economy, and uh, some of the key indicators I would say are one consumer uh, spending. Mm -hmm. So consumer spending hasn't really gone down. I remember a couple of months back uh, when you were talking about uh, the COVID savings, the average American has run out their COVID savings. Uh, inflation is on the rise. Housing, is, uh, housing prices are on the rise. They are bound to hurt the U.S. consumer. But then what we are seeing is uh, people taking on advantage of uh, financial technology tools uh, one of them being the buy now, pay later. We saw it being uh, overly used during the Cyber Monday and Thanksgiving spending. A lot of people like uh, would literally buy things with the same appetite as they did last year, only that this year they don't have as much money, so they take advantage of the buy now, pay later uh, feature where they can pay for those purchases over an extended period of time. Okay. So... At the same time, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, stretch happening in the credit card balances. So Americans are basically extending their credit cards and are spending more from that. So the consumer appetite has uh, remained significantly high, which is also a key driver of the high inflation environment. So while energy prices have been dropping over 20% over the last couple of months, uh, we have seen a multi-month low. I think uh, today, if you look at Brent oil prices, they are at $73 uh, per barrel. And just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm talking about somewhere around September, we had seen oil trading at $95 per barrel. So that's a significantly huge drop. And uh, with uh, oil prices being down over 22%, uh, we can no longer blame inflation on uh, high energy prices. Uh, we might focus on other things that might be contributing to the high inflation, mm -hmm. such as the deficit spending that the U.S. is currently implementing. Yeah, and uh, of course, now that you have brought in that, I think it is worth noting last time we were here, we touched significantly on the voting on the uh, uh, approval for funding to the Ukraine war, to the to the uh, uh, Israelis and the Hamas situation. Yeah. And uh, based on the few sentiments I've gotten and the speeches I've seen, yeah. Biden is saying uh, uh, America's ability to continue supporting the war yeah. is significantly dropping yes. and they might not be able to do it. So and you I see, think for me, if America perhaps stops funding all this war yeah. and let to some degree, I, I know, uh, of course, in the as in the spirit of morality yes. and uh, humanity, yeah. always good to support, you know, yeah. uh, peace. Those, those peace and also those who do not have the ability to do it. Yeah. But yeah. so far we have seen, uh, I, I want to say in the most delicate language possible. Uh, it's warmongering. Yes, there is a lot of warmongering yeah. and a lack of willingness to sort of yeah. uh, sit down on the table and explore Yes. Less costly means. And therefore, I believe when finances are removed yeah. uh, in this scenario, it will sort of calm down and bring uncertainty. Yeah. And that uncertainty of what will happen next yeah. is much better, I think, yeah. than knowing you financing this guy, I am financing this guy, let's see who's, whose weapon skills the most. I think yes. that is what will happen. And with that, we are coming to the realization that perhaps that focusing on spending outside the economy because 
we as traders and investors are following whatever is happening to their budget, yeah. we can be able to map out, okay, next year we are approaching an election year in the US. We know this will definitely come up in the debate. Yes. It has already come out. Yes. Perhaps with certainty that they will not be funding all these things. Yes. And during the debate and everything, we know they both the Democrats and the Republicans yeah. are united in the sense that we will not be financing this war, yeah. but we'll be advocating for dialogue and negotiation yeah. can be a good for guidance yeah. to perhaps how the uh, the the balance sheet of the Fed will look like yes. and obviously their revenue, how it will be spent perhaps back again to the whatever we didn't wanted in infrastructure, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in uh, research in, uh, in, of course, uh, what was it, microchips and the rest. I think that would be a good way yeah. and a, a bullish signal for the U.S. economy. Yeah, I remember uh, back uh, during the Trump era, he was basically looking for around $10 billion to just build a wall that would uh, ensure proper border controls. But then uh, that money was, wasn't available due to politics. But somehow, uh, four years down the line, the U.S. has can afford over $100 billion to Ukraine and even more money to uh, Israel. It doesn't make sense, especially for Americans mm. that are trying to look out for other Americans. So with the homelessness crisis and uh, what we are seeing happening with the border crisis, um, I think the Republicans have identified it as a major issue of national concern. And uh, it's that uh, reason that they walked out of the Senate meeting uh, since they could not um, go for approving another funding for Ukraine and Israel well, their country is uh, still suffering from uh, open borders. Yes. So I think that is going to be a key theme uh, in politics during this election year. Remember, the U.S. is doing its national elections in November next year. So being in December today, we are within one year to the election. I think it will be the first, normally the first Tuesday of mm -hmm. November every four, four years. years. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, back to inflation yeah i think those are some of the drivers because uh, they are spending more yes they are borrowing at a higher cost and then yeah. resurfacing them yeah. definitely trickles down to the cost of uh, you know uh, of, of, of cash within the economy so definitely if the fed were looking for one of the reasons why inflation is high despite all the everything else yeah i think that is one of them yeah, there's still excess liquidity from the COVID money that was uh, printed yes so if you look at the u.s system uh, when they were printing out of money, mm. out of uh, this value would end up in uh, financial securities yeah. because normal businesses were not investable. Yeah. So you wouldn't just open a new company during COVID because there were lockdowns and everything. Yeah. So out of this money found itself uh, in uh, assets such as uh, stocks. Uh, we saw it happening in bonds. We also saw it happening in uh, cryptocurrencies and so on. Yeah. So the Fed has been trying uh, really hard to pull this uh, new injected money out of the system, but somehow it's not flowing out. Uh, you, you see, like, um, if it's trying to pull out uh, liquidity from the system, uh, it would have to encourage more people to save, um, try to... Spend less. Uh, spend less. On especially uh, luxuries uh, like, uh, you know, but... Lower uh, pricing in uh, real estate, high unemployment, but somehow the Fed is not able to achieve that. Unemployment rate has re remained resilient. Yeah. Uh, as per the last week, it was 3.7%. And uh, the Fed was looking to push unemployment rates up to 5%. So that's one front that the Fed has completely failed. Yeah, well, if you do that, the politicians will not agree. For somebody like Biden who, or the yeah. Democrats who are seeking re a re-election, yeah. they will always run with the card that we have brought inflation to record 50-year low. Yeah. So I know they are fighting a war, even though they are trying to be independent, yeah. it will be very difficult to achieve the 5%. Yeah, basically what they are doing right now is uh, postponing what we call the hard landing. So we know that the U.S. at some point is going to experience the hard landing. Um, think about it this way. Um, if, if the U.S. economy was a drunkard, it's this one guy who wakes up uh, one morning, he has important stuff to do, but he has a hang hangover. <laughs> so he, since he don't doesn't want to go through the hangover, takes one more drink that uh, enables him to have uh, the necessary energy to keep going. But then you can't be taking that uh, syrup every morning. So if every morning you wake up, you have a hangover, you take one more drink, 
You continue drinking through the day and uh, doing your stuff. Then you do it the second and the third day. At some point, you're going to have to stop, then face the hangover itself. Go through the tough pain. You are quoting uh, JP Morgan that the US is, uh, is, 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 is so hungry and thirsty for debt, yeah. like a drunken sailor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jamie yeah. Dimon, I, yeah. I'll attribute that to yeah. Jamie Dimon. And, so, uh-huh. The thing is, um, if the US is a consumer economy, heavily driven by consumers, uh, during COVID, they retire printed money, they adopt money to people. Yeah. I think they were $1,400 steamies. So during that period, people would have enough cash to continue spending and keep the economic wheel going. But then what we are seeing today is people continuing with this uh, consumption uh, trend, but then their in- incomes are not expanding at the same rate. So what you are seeing is people taking on extra jobs, moving to cheaper housing. Um, their budgets are really hard, but they still have the appetite to spend. So they go for buy now, pay later. They go for more credit card loans. At some point, the bank will have to stop. Definitely. When there's not enough money in the system, mm-hmm. when you have uh, reached your credit card limit, uh, when you have reached your buy now, pay later limits, when the non-performing loans are now beginning to rise across board, then I think that will be the point where the U.S. actually takes the bitter pill of uh, going through the hangover. Okay. But somehow, uh, due to the politics involved during the election year, uh, I see a potential where the U.S. Uh, government start, uh, props up the market artificially, uh, keeps things going just as fine. Um, high interest rates, uh, inflation, I would say, is a significant low, even though it's cumulative. Mm. Uh, it doesn't mean that the inflation we experienced in 2020, 2021, 2022 has gone away. Prices have reasonably gone high. Yeah. So even if the rate of change in prices today is not as fast as before, that increase that happened over that uh, four-year period is already present in current prices. Excellent. So it's already hurting consumer budgets, especially if your income did not grow as much. Yeah. So going forward, I... I see a potential where the markets remained, uh, remain propped up. Uh, we see all-time highs happening in the NASDAQ, SP500. At the same time, uh, we see uh, the Fed holding rates higher for longer. But then at some point, once we start seeing cracks in the system, then perhaps we'll start uh, seeing some form of recession happening next year. Which sectors would you say would be the first indicator yeah. that uh, a recession is happening? Say, for, for uh, yeah. Let me frame it like that because I know Nasdaq doesn't just fall on its own. Yeah. This year, if you look at the best performance, yeah. they are quite evident. Yeah. Uh, they are involved in, uh, you know, the proper tech side, the software side, be it involved in some way commercializing um, um, artificial intelligence, yeah. be it some way supporting artificial intelligence. Um, I think those are the sectors which have really uh, maintained some uh, positive price growth in the market and obviously the revenues. Which sector do you think will be the first ones to crack yeah. to indicate, okay, now we are sort of entering a recession period yeah. and maybe the bears will actually kick in? Well, there's uh, quite a number. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, I think we would see some uh, reasonable cracks uh, happening in uh, luxury spending. Uh, luxury spending could uh, take a hit, especially if uh, the general, I would say, middle income uh, American uh, starts getting the effect of uh, current rates, current inflation, then they might reduce on their luxury. So we could also be seeing some heat uh, on consumer cyclicals, uh, whereas uh, you might not reduce on the, let's say, amount of money you use to, let's say, buy food, uh, buy fuel, pay your bills. Uh, you might uh, push the idea of buying a new Tesla a little bit further away. So for companies that are within the consumer cyclical sector, they could take a big hit. So if you are selling goods that are consumed and uh, maybe your clients consume your goods once a year or once every couple of years, then your good is not as sticky. So in that case, you might experience some weakness uh, resulting from the current economic cycle. Now, interesting that you mentioned uh, luxury spending. Yeah. Um, you know this Chinese company which is going for an IPO, Shein. 
Yes. Yeah. If uh, and I link that with another one, uh, I was reading a report recently by um, one of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, po- uh, Bloomberg uh, reporters, yes. Barry Rittles, yeah. that the people who are buying luxury watches, like you know, Rolex, uh, Audemars, uh, um, uh, Seiko's, yeah. the the demand is significantly going down. The sales, even uh, resell. Yeah. The prices are going down. Yeah. There is little demand in that side. Yeah. If you look at LVMH, the entire uh, portfolio, people are not, uh, uh, let's say, going for the high, uh, high end or high, uh, you know, um, in terms of price. Yeah, they are being choosy of which luxury to purchase. Yes. If you uh, recently there was an interview, uh, I think it was on COP28 yeah. with the Mercedes Benz Daimler CEO. Yeah. Their luxury brand uh, sales for 2023 yes. are projected to remain stable yeah. or fairly equal yeah. to 2022. Yeah. So it means as much as maybe um, people there is a sense of a lot of money out there. Yeah. People and even the wealthy people are not that just spending it like that. They yeah. are quite choosy on which side sort of luxury yeah. to take on. So I think if if I were to look for next year, yeah. uh, that is what that explains why uh Apple and iPhone 15 numbers. Yeah. I would really want to see how Q Q4, yeah. Q1 yes. 2024 yeah. look like. I expect a slump in that uh let's say side of their, you know, retail business. Yeah. Yeah. So um from what I'm seeing um I would say that investors are correct, as you said. They are being very choosy on where they put their money. But then, at the same time, I see some sense of extreme greed in the markets. Where if the Nasdaq is just flying higher and higher, the AI stocks are just uh, rocking in new highs every week, week in, week out. A lot of investors are finding these gains to be really good. So they are just adding more and more to those positions. Or holding on to them. Yes, or holding on to them. Uh-huh. So the appetite for risk is significantly high, and our key indicator would be what happened with gold last week. Excellent. So I remember yeah. gold uh, opening and rising to levels about ab- above 2180, and that was uh, on Monday. Then immediately after that, we saw the prices are dropping further back downwards, and eventually ending the week at around 2020. So today, we are seeing some further downside momentum with gold trading at 1981. And um, if you see such a huge shift, gold moving from 2180 to 1980, uh, I would say that is uh, at, uh, at least $200 an ounce of gold. Uh, that basically means that there's a huge sh- shift from uh, investors who are majorly risk off now to turn into risk on. Mm-hmm. So with the re- investors being risk on, uh, they are going for these assets and they are getting some uh, record uh, returns. So I, I believe the FOMO is currently very prevalent in the markets. So when you look at the um, luxury spending sector, I would say a good indicator would be what we normally describe as the lipstick index. So lipstick index is a kind of weird, counterintuitive, but it makes sense when you look at the data. So it's a financial indicator that uses cost- cosmetic sales to predict recessions on bear markets. <laughs> wow. So uh, for people who are used to, let's say, um, luxury spending. Yeah, cake, that like the Kim Kardashian, uh, KKK. Uh, um, no, I'm talking about like uh, the average uh, American middle class. Okay. So when things are not doing so well, um, they will not stop purchasing luxury products. But then, just to feel good, they will buy a smaller item rather than the bigger items that they are used to. Uh-huh. So in this case, some, uh, you might find increased purchases of uh, lipstick and small cosmetic items compared to the bigger ones. Like a handbag, a shoe. Yes, you might not uh, go for the latest Prada bag, but you might find it uh, easy to just go and buy a new lipstick product and have some satisfaction that you did your beauty or cosmetic and satisfied that need. Okay. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Now, to the other side of the pond, yeah. um, in addition to that, uh, some of the factors I believe would be driving the index next year. Yeah. Uh, I think it was on Thursday when the EU announced that they have come up with regulations for artificial intelligence. Eh? Yes. I 
find that quite interesting. Why? I mean, uh, crypto market has literally been here for a while. Yes. I believe they must have some regulations on crypto. Yes, they have. They already have. Yes. But I, 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 I want to think it is not as restrictive. Yes. Perhaps I haven't really gone through the entire uh, AI laws of the EU, uh, yeah. but I'll definitely check it out. And uh, if you look at that and the European companies, yeah. they are basically not in the competitive global stage. Yes. Um, uh, I had and, this funny question, uh, uh, somebody asking, yeah. um, over the last 20 years, uh, how many tech companies do you uh, know from Europe that have completely dominated the world? Spotify. Huh? Wow. I think it's only Spotify. Spotify? Yeah. So there's quite a number, but uh, they're not like that dominant. That's why I said yeah. that has dominated the world. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say Spotify has dominated the world. I mean, uh, they, Google, Apple people Podcast, use iPhone, YouTube. but they still... Uh, subscribe to Spotify. Spotify music for some reason because yeah. I like right now the rap Spotify rap thing it's a beautiful a yeah. g- g- great marketing tool and it actually allows you to you know it's yeah. a good piece of data that you assess yourself at the end of the year yeah. and you are happy if you get your report okay so I listen to this amount of music 200,000 yeah. minutes it's a good piece of data maybe uh-huh. you can align your listening to more productive or, okay let's take it a notch higher yeah uh, what are the top AI products coming in from Europe right now? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. That's why I said, <laughs> going over the pond, <laughs> the regulation has <laughs> significantly crippled Let's take innovation. It even higher. Yeah. EVs. Uh, what uh, are the top EVs coming from Europe right now? Ah, uh, no. Is there any? Yeah, there is. I know Mercedes are making there, but they are. They yeah, are, there's Mercedes, uh, there's Volkswagen, uh, there's uh, Stellantis. So all these guys. I feel like Europe is lagging behind in terms of our tech advancement. And um, it has been noticed by so many economists saying that uh, Europe is being deindustrialized. And I don't think that is serving Europe well. And it's it's a red flag going forward. Over the next couple of years, I don't think Europe will be as competitive mm. compared to the Asian and American counterparts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is this comment made by foreign affairs minister from uh, China yeah. where he was saying that uh, Europeans are complaining about their trade deficit. Yeah. Yet there is a lot of embargo or yeah. trade restrictions to Chinese trading with, yes. uh, including sharing of information and everything, yeah. playing a negative role in that. But there is this other obvious aspect. And yeah. uh, this obviously is a hot topic which some investors in America yeah. have sort of Brushed it, brushed it, it aside. Yeah. Climate. Yes. Right now we are entering winter. Yeah. It would just make sense if you have fossil uh, fuel. energy, fossil yeah. fuel energy, yeah. because of its reliability during this time. Yeah. Now, if you do not have sunshine, there is literally no wind, and more importantly, it is too cold to allow the turbines to turn, even though there is t- uh, wind. Yeah it becomes quite unsustainable. As much as fossil fuel can do whatever it will, yeah. it has survived, but shifting completely. Yeah. Uh, and the way manufacturing, especially like you said, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, making electric vehicles, that means you need a lot of energy to just make sure those panels are up to standard and the rest. So I think that is one of the reasons why even shutting down the Germany's coal plants yeah. has played a key role in deindustrialization, deindustrializing yeah. European economy. Well, as per last year, yeah. I think uh, Germany was the most advanced European economy in Definitely. terms of uh, green energy adoption. They faced extreme weather. There was a really strong winter that covered their solar panels, covered their wind turbines. And immediately, they realized the big experiment they have been doing is not sustainable. First, they, they have not secured the, uh, I would call them, the, the, uh, the supply chains for rare earth metals, and uh, this includes, uh, uh, I would say, ores that are used to create batteries. So if they, they haven't secured that and they don't have sufficient batteries in Germany, then if you're doing uh, wind, wind is not consistent, doesn't run 24 hours, 
Uh, if you're doing solar, it's not consistent. It doesn't run 24 hours, especially during winter. So it's not a reliable source of energy. And at the same time, it's not even cheaper than uh, coal and uh, petroleum, diesel and petrol. So we are seeing a big step back where a lot of investors uh, that were climate-oriented, remember when they introduced these ratings for companies to show like uh, how uh, environmental friendly a company is before making an investment decision. So that used to be a trend back in the day, but now what we are realizing is that uh, a lot of investors as well as companies are realizing the importance of uh, fossil fuels uh, in their production. Remember for companies, their goal is to make a profit. Yeah. So in this case, they have a whole responsibility to their shareholders. Yeah. So seeing these companies uh, struggle by going green and then realizing that fossil fuels are much more reliable and cheaper, we have seen that transition happen. And I believe the best example is uh, Warren Buffett snapping up over 20% of Occidental Petroleum last year. And I believe that should be picking up this year. I think they have acquired another exploring company in the Southern America, yeah. which picked up the news last week. Yeah. And uh, in line with that, uh, they say the market is a moral it doesn't really go with feel good, yes. feel good, uh, you know, sentiments. And uh, like I said, I think there is uh, one of these uh, uh, American uh, hedge funds strive for those who will be listening can go and check on it. Yeah. They have they they deviated from uh, you know ESG yeah. and went into purely objective um, investments yeah. that brings maximum value to the investors. And within the shortest period of time, they were under, I think it was $1 trillion assets under management yeah. and good returns. That, can, can, can you imagine the, the Nasdaq is up 50% yes. year to date. Yes. Then you go to your fund manager and they start t- telling you, oh, we did not invest in this company. Because we, they we do felt not. they didn't have a good f- footprint on the environment. <laughs> <laughs> and that is your retirement <laughs> funds down. Yeah, down. No, Nobody is buying that shit. <laughs> I want my money. I want my returns. I want them to be competitive. Yeah. So if um, you're running a fund and you're trying to uh, talk about uh, climate, then you're in the wrong business. I think because they need to be objective. You see what Tesla has done. Yes. That's why people love it. Uh, and uh, and 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 Musk did a good thing. He said, yeah. "Okay, yeah. since you all are struggling in catching up yes. with the, what I'm doing, yeah. let me share with you the blueprint on making a battery yeah. that will not only harness power yeah. but also store it and disperse it or dispense it yeah. at a ratio." similar yeah. to if you are using fossil fuel. Yeah. I think that is the first step because most of them have been rushing to use perhaps yeah. different battery types. Yeah. But he decided, okay, first thing, yeah. need to make sure that the battery is good yes. so that it does not die after a few years. Yes. So I think if that sort of technology can be harnessed to green energy, yes. then it can add value because that means that, yes, we'll be setting all these wind turbines, yeah. but in a way to store the energy and distribute it uh, efficiently yeah. can make sure that the adoption is profitable to the companies involved with the business. Well, I think that is how I look at b- it. Bringing the conversation back to decentralization, yes. you know that there is uh, multiple sources of uh, fossil fuels in the world. Yeah, uh, You'll find oil in uh, America, North America, South America, in Africa, in the Middle East, in yeah. Asia, and so on. Yes. So oil is a much more stable supply compared to when you decide to go green. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, if you decide to go green, uh, all solar panels, they require the same or similar kind of materials. Yes. So uh, the sources for lithium, uh, the sources for, uh, I would call it, um, silicon, and all those rare earth metals are in very few countries. So if you look at lithium, there's like three countries in the world that have the total supply. So, or a majority of the supply in the world. So what that does is that it makes the entire world entirely dependent on a smaller set of countries or even companies that are running in those countries. And the more the demand, the higher the cost yes, of acquiring de- it. Yes, definitely. If yeah. there's, uh, let's say, five countries in the world that have the top supply of uranium and uh, the entire world is going into nuclear power, then those three countries basically dominate everything. And this has been the case with microchips. Um, 
the Taiwan Semiconductor Company and uh, other companies within Taiwan, they supply the world with uh, over 50% of microchips. And uh, when you look at the top tier ones, like the top, top quality chips, over 90% of the supply comes from Taiwan. So that has made Taiwan an extremely strategic uh, partner to the rest of the world. And if Taiwan was to carve today, if something was to happen to the Taiwanese government and uh, let's say they are not able to produce chips for the next two or three years, then the whole digital revolution in the world would uh, crumble immediately. Because we wouldn't have microchips for creating cars, mm. electronics, phones, laptops, servers, and so on. Yeah. So it would be a big hit. And if this is the same reasoning we are applying to going green in terms of energy, then there has to be ways of making sure if it's battery technology, uh, the inputs are not purely based on one or two countries. And at the same time, the core materials used to develop solar panels with turbines they have to be reasonably available. But then if that's not possible, then perhaps we are better off with fossil fuels. We are better off having it until, let's say, we have structures yeah. or we we'll integrate it so that it becomes a, a perfect alternative yeah. as the research, innovation, alternative uh, materials to, you know, the rare earth yes. is found or recycled. Yes. Then at least I think that way we are able to uh, make it sustainable. I'll refer back to Musk. Yeah. He he's one of those first uh, people involved, especially on the SpaceX. Yeah. They literally reuse all their rocket ships. Yes. It doesn't. They don't have to build a new one. They'll just repair it, work out a few issues, yes. and then go back again to space. And that is why SpaceX, I think, uh, up to some time half in mid year, yeah. they were able to announce that they are broken even yes. in terms of their expenditure and revenue from all their expeditions. Yeah, the, that company is, uh, as of today, valued at around $180 billion. Yes. Yeah, and uh, this week they announced that they are, they are raising more funds. And I think they so, are raising, doing private equity um, sell-offs and deals. Yes. And I believe they'll go into the market with a higher valuation. Definitely. If they do go into the markets next year, yeah. I think they'll definitely be one of those companies for the decade of 2024. Mm-hmm. And another indicator of every investor will be doing uh, NASDAQ yeah. to be looking at. Because if they, NASDAQ and S&P 500, I yeah. think they'll have a significant role to play yeah. in where the prices of these companies go for the next this decade. So a quick one. Uh-huh. If uh, both companies were to go public. Which one? Uh, X and SpaceX. Uh-huh. Uh, which one would you go for? Which, which shares are you buying? In the, in the, in the philosophy of Benjamin Graham, yeah. Uh, value for money. Yeah. I'll start with X. <laughs> I'll start with X. I have my That's reservation about space exploration. Yeah. I still haven't seen the commercial side of it that yeah. I'd say yeah. this company would make money over 10 years of time, right? Yeah. I only see maybe they'll be shipping uh, satellites for other companies, yeah. but it's not like a business. There is a lot of millions already of satellites out there yeah. supplying the same information. So I'd go with X due yeah. to one thing. Um, data yeah. is invaluable. Data is like gold. Yeah. For me, uh, in the spirit of uh, Warren Buffett, uh, if it's a company whose product you have consumed, mm. uh, you have enjoyed, uh, you have spent money on, and you feel it has a very strong business model. And moat. And moat, definitely then that's the company to go for. So in my case, I would still go for Twitter X. Full disclosure, I was a shareholder of Twitter. Yeah. I got bought out. Yeah. At, uh, I think it was 52. Yeah. So. Yeah, you will I, still be back. I'll still be back. I'd be happy to be, <laughs> to be back at X. I think that is uh, that is a uh, wild. That is my, my preference. And I think uh, with the liberalization of it, yeah. uh, there are some significant private players in that company. Yeah. Right? The acquisition of Twitter didn't just go by him putting yes. out some of his shares. I think if you look at one of the greatest uh, investors in the U.S., uh, uh, this guy, uh, CEO of Pershing Square, yeah. uh, Bill Ackman is there. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of banks, JP is there who finance that deal. So if they saw value in that, yeah. And they are putting huge bets on Musk. Yeah. It's only fair me as a small player yeah. to put in there my bet and yeah. capitalize as much as I can. So I think uh, they they will definitely find a way to streamline the revenues. Yeah. I think if if you, if you sort of um, 
address the issue of ad revenue yeah or uh, maybe and uh, how information is dispensed yeah um Uh, you add in payment system as we have seen yeah. the payment system people can earn money yes. you put in live streaming yeah. that means that you may not necessarily need to have youtube yeah it will become the every, everything up exactly uh, the moment you get uh, direct phone calls via x yeah uh, a marketplace uh, they also introducing a job place definitely i think it's going to be huge but on the data side i think Elon Musk is already make, making some revenues from selling data scraping okay. so all the previous apps that you are used to know that would be linked to to twitter now they are paying to access that data yeah exactly so, so uh-huh. if you have an ai and you need data to train it for you to access twitter you would have to pay for that data so right now i think there is a uh, multiple revenue streams for twitter and um There's a very uh, rosy outlook for Twitter. So if it were to go back public again, uh, it would make uh, some really good returns. Excellent. Back to the story of Europe, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and uh, energy source. Yeah. Uh, I like to go to the currency side as we wrap up the year. We have seen the euro gain some strength against the dollar. Yes. But also lose significantly yeah. against the dollar. Um what is your outlook on the euro, CHF and at least uh, you know pound? Well, uh for the European currencies, uh I would say uh they still have a long way to go uh, in order for them to regain full strength. And uh, some of the key hindrances include one, uh, the deindustrialization that is currently happening as a result of uh, the high energy costs uh, within the eurozone, high labor costs, uh, too much regulation, high taxation. That has discouraged out of companies from uh, operating within the eurozone. Okay. So for their central banks, uh, the ECB, which regulates about 20 countries in the eurozone and creates a monetary policy for them, hasn't been uh, overly aggressive in hiking rates but then uh, I wouldn't say they have won against uh, inflation so the inflation battle is still quite a challenge for the eurozone uh, the UK had uh, one of the highest uh, inf- inflation rates among the G20 uh, their interest rates are still significantly high and they have not yet fully had, uh, addressed the inflation problem okay so what we have seen this year is that uh, this two currencies have uh, basically uh, made some good return over the dollar uh i think the euro itself hit 1.1 some point in the year yes. which was a quite a positive outlook given some time last year we were doing sub uh, 09 0.9 0.98 yes. there about so i think if at all the dollar will start strengthening yeah. they will really suffer at least in terms of trade uh, even with their partners in the in the in the globally generally well i think the last couple of months when the dollar was uh, extremely bearish yeah. uh, it lost quite some ground to these currencies yeah so year to date the euro is still 0.8% above the dollar mm-hmm. uh, the pound is up 3.62% and uh, the swiss franc is up 5.53% so this means that um, there's a lot of investors are, that are betting that these three central banks the snb bank of england and ecb mm. might have to hold rates higher for longer in order to address the high inflation environment so keeping rates higher for longer means that bond yields might remain significantly higher uh, in the eurozone uh, basically attracting more capital and as a result uh, driving the scarcity of their local currencies okay whereas on the other hand We have seen that J- JPY has been the biggest loser of the year among the top currencies. Uh, it's currently down 10.01% against the dollar year to date. And um, it's continuing to recover. I remember it had extended this uh, to, I think, above 15%. Yeah. Uh, last year, it had hit 30% uh, in the better part of the year. The yen was really breeding against the dollar. But then from the indications we have seen from the new C- um, Bank of Japan governor, uh, Kazuo Ueda, there is a high likelihood that the Bank of Japan is preparing for positive interest rates. Definitely. So yeah. if they switch from negative 0.1 to something positive mm-hmm. and remove the yield curve control, then there is bound to be a lot of capital flowing into Japan compared to what we were seeing where a lot of capital was flowing away from Japan. 
Yeah, I think that is what that would be one thing we'll be looking at in the next BOJ meeting. Yes. And uh, obviously I think uh perhaps we might see them for the at least for the better part of 2024 strengthening significantly against the dollar. Yeah, also other Asian currencies. Australian dollar is down 3.77%, New Zealand dollar 3.92%. But I think this has been majorly influenced by their big brother, China. Yeah. Yeah. So China has been going through deflation. The currency has uh, currency has not been doing well. So being a major trading partner with Australia and New Zealand, if China is doing badly, then they also tend to suffer the same consequences. Yeah, definitely. Now to the other gold, the liquid gold, oil. <laughs> yeah, as we wrap up at least the year. Yeah. Um, I did not foresee, I will not lie, uh, oil going down 69 again, 68 dollars a barrel. Um, I think uh, that is a surprise. Yes. And I would say um, the US uh, played proper chess on this game and uh, they came out as winners against the OPEC. Because you remember the time when oil was at around 80, 90, 100, they emptied their reserves as much as they could. And then when the price hit 70 and stabilized for at least 70s, early 70s, 70 to 74, yeah. and stabilized for, I think, two weeks, yeah. they refilled again their stock. And yeah. they refilled significantly. And they announced publicly that we are going to buy as much as we can. Yeah. And right now at 68, they announced again they are going to produce and increase their production capacity by 30,000 barrels yeah. a day yeah. for the next at least two months. And that sunk the price of oil. I think it sunk by almost 5% on Friday. That would be on, uh, I think it was the 10th or something, 9th of Yes, December. and, and four, further 4% on Monday. Exactly. Mm. I, I think uh, what we are seeing here is that um, the battle continues. It's not a story that started today. Um, a, key, the, a key point in the, in the story of oil was uh, just before COVID, uh, around March 2020, when uh, Saudi Arabia and the OPEC plus nations uh, realized that they are losing market share to U.S. shale oil companies. So in that case, they decided to flood the market with excess oil. So they would just produce too much oil and pump that in the market. That led to excess supply and oil markets crashed. So we saw um, Brent oil trading at, uh, I think, $14 per barrel. Yeah. And uh, WTI going for $8 per barrel. Then later on, we would have futures trading even at a negative because nobody would uh, want to hold on to those positions. Yeah. So later on, they agreed on our production quotas, that is the OPEC plus nations, after driving the U.S. shale oil companies out. Remember, at such prices, the shale companies would not produce oil because it doesn't make business sense for them. So uh, fast forward, uh, we got to uh, this Biden administration, where his first initial action once he joined office was to sign the climate change, Paris Climate Change Agreement, uh, which will reduce the shale mining uh, or shale production of oil and uh, support green energy. So since then, U.S. oil production has been significantly low. So for then, uh, Biden has been uh, drawing from the SPR. But then by drawing from the SPR, he was able to manipulate oil prices lower and achieve his target of dropping inflation back to the target, though it's still 1.1% higher than the target. But then what we are seeing, as the OPEC nations have uh, vowed to keep oil prices higher, they have been cutting their output when oil prices were trading at $80, $90 per barrel, which was very profitable for U.S. shale oil companies. So to take advantage of the uh, missing output, the U.S. shale oil companies produced even more, exported to Europe. Remember, they already bombed the Nord Stream yeah. uh, pipelines. Yeah. So the Europe is heavily dependent on the U.S. So recently, the U.S. was lifting sanctions on Venezuela so that it can get access to the Venezuelan oil and continue dominating the markets. So Saudi Arabia is a little bit very concerned uh, with uh, what's currently happening because they are losing market share and they are not achieving the goals they are, that they are looking to achieve by cutting oil output. So this is leading to the potential that an all-out war might, might happen uh, for oil-producing countries. And whenever there is such a war, it leads to excess supply in the markets. I'll tell you, um, as a trader of oil right now, yeah. short-term positions are the best yeah. following whatever sentiment is there. Yeah. 
Yes. If you see the bearish move gaining momentum and you're holding on to longs, yeah. So long yeah, as, if your margin can sustain it, yeah. well and good. Yeah. And that is if you bought it at a close yeah. to the lowest price ever, yeah. around $49. Yeah. But if you bought it at $90, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that price you might have to wait for yeah. something significant to happen to drive the price up. <laughs> Other than that... You might have to prepare noodles for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. Very true. Yeah. Because uh, I think at, at around 70 was a fair price. Yeah. But that sudden drop and consistent the entire day... Yeah is not to be ignored. It's the same case with the when when the Japanese when they announced they are going to, you know, I think for 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 short term traders, yeah. better to align with the current sentiments and yeah. take advantage and manage your risk appropriately as opposed to the normal support and resistance while yeah. ignoring the fundamentals actually driving that price action. You know, the lowest price we have seen in oil this year yes. was $70 per barrel. So as of right now, Oil is trading at seventy-three point six five one dollars after hitting sixty-eight. Yes. So uh, no, it, it never got to sixty-eight. This that year. is the US oil this or US Brent. 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 Oh, Brent. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brent. So lowest was seventy, yeah. and today is seventy-three point six. So we are just uh, three dollars higher than the all-time low for this year. And like I said, this year the market has been trying to hit the all-time highs yeah. or all-time lows. So I am. I will not be surprised if we yeah. hit Brent at sixty-eight and the UK US oil at fifty-nine. I will not be surprised. Yes. So um, what I'm seeing going forward is uh, the OPEC like completely reverting policy or pivoting, uh, flooding the oil markets uh, with supply. Uh, when oil prices go significantly low, the US shale oil companies will be bankrupt. They will not be able to operate at those prices. Yeah. So when they do that and drive them off, then we see a V-shaped recovery in oil prices. And for context purposes, I believe today OPEC should release their monthly reports and projections. It's EIA. Yes. Even EIA. Be- yeah. Before the EIA re- release theirs, yeah. OPEC will also release theirs yes. so that they can spook the market. Yes. And then by the time we get the data from the EIA, we'll know, okay, are the US continuing the production or they're buying to fill up the SPR? Yes. But whatever happens, I still am feeling bearish until we hit record lows yeah. before we can go back up. I think that would be my prediction for oil, yeah. at least to wrap up the year. Whenever this goes out, I don't know where the prices will be, yeah. but we'll be there no matter what. Does that, does that mean that there is a good likelihood to stack up on uh, oil stocks next year? Yes. If you look at the worst performing companies on Dow Jones, yeah. Chevron is down 19% at the moment. Interesting. Yes. Um, I'm it's looking at uh, ExxonMobil here. Exactly. Uh, it's uh, it's down 11%, the Chevron the... 20%. Exactly. Uh, Occidental, which was up over 100% last year, yeah. is down 11.81%. And I would attribute the 11.1% as opposed to 20 like its peers yeah. to the recent acquisition of, I think, one of the oil uh, uh, explorers in uh, Venezuela and Guyana. Yeah. So those are the attributors to why even it is not performing poorly, Occidental. But I would be looking at them next year. Yeah, or I'll they, be aligning my position as we close up the year, yeah. depending on how EIA data comes out today, yeah. and stack up for next year. Yeah, there's also a hidden corporation that is uh, doing out of uh, oil exploration in Mexico. Yeah. And uh, it's looking to bridge the gap that was left by Russia in Europe. And uh, perhaps by January, mm. uh, it will be in full-scale operation, yeah. and that could significantly drop uh, gas prices. And I think gas prices have already started responding to the same in the market yeah. because that information is already priced in. I would want to see if any major corporation would buy that explorer. Yeah. That would be my bet, either yeah. Occidental or BP or Shell yeah. or even Aramco. Yeah. So those are be those are be those will be the private market or private equity activity yeah. I'll be looking at to drive at least. So yeah, I'm very quite. You see, when you are talking about sectors to drive the market, yes. I'd be very bullish, especially if we hit the all-time lows yes. and we have already hit the all-time highs in the store, in the equity market, yeah. a correction is definitely overdue. We don't know when, of course, yeah. but at some point there will be a correction. Yes, I think that would be my outlook for the year. Yeah, in terms of recession, investors tend to bet out of uh, investments in technology, uh, mainly because uh, oil technology may take a big hit it's usually the fastest to recover. I yeah. uh, remember the dot com era and how like uh, the top stocks uh, were the leading um, stocks in recovery. So I think uh, it has been the same. 
So after seeing a stock market recession last year, where a majority of the stock market indices were down, uh, SP500, the Dow Jones, uh, the Nasdaq, uh, from what we are seeing as evidence this year, the Nasdaq being up 50%, it means that it has uh, completely recovered from last year's losses, mm. and uh, it could even end the year higher. Yeah, definitely. So uh, the Dow Jones uh, is making some decent gains, being up 10%. Uh, SP 520 20%, but then tech seems to be the leading uh, <coughs> the leading sector. Yeah. So and going into next year, do you yeah. think tech will be the leading sector again or will it be overtaken by oil? It's similar to what happened in 2021. If you look at the Oracle report, yeah. cloud computing is not really gaining much. Yeah. And this is not an outlier. Yeah. If you look at the Microsoft earnings report, yeah. cloud sales, were, is it Microsoft or Amazon? Uh, One of the Amazon, two, Amazon, Amazon yeah. their cloud cloud aspect is not really picking up cloud yeah. sales as opposed to what investors are expecting. Yeah. If that isn't a sign that people are not really enthusiastic about technology, which would say is new, reliable, fast, and everything, yeah. but not tested and proven, yeah. that is my sort of uh, uh, you know risk warning yeah. to take a pause from it. Yeah. So yeah, I would expect because it. Well, most of, let's say, something like NVIDIA. Yeah. It has been driven fundamentally by the noise on AI yeah. and, of course, good book in terms of order book, yeah. but not fundamentally in terms of, let's say, they are making killing cells or something like that. Yeah. So the radars have read, uh, uh, it's like a wind, like a snowball effect because um, uh, NVIDIA was doing well, AMD would do well, yes. uh, Microsoft would do well, yeah. and because Microsoft has a good research engine in the name of OpenAI, yeah. it can lead to whatever they will do to their uh, Microsoft ecosystem. Well, but it seems like a good indicator. Yeah. Uh, if you look at Tesla and how people make pre-orders before a uh, car model is even manufactured, yeah. and now that NVIDIA is getting the same kind of demand, mm. that they have a new chip, uh, that is, they are producing, let's say, by next year. Uh, those chips have already been bought even before production. Well, uh, I think that's a key driver and a key indicator of uh, good things to come. Remember when Boeing had orders cancelled? Yes. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> and it is not like Microsoft are not making their own chip. I, I, Apple, I, I, Apple are making their own chip. So if all this come up with a better, more efficient, user-designated chips yeah. that is a, a good competitor to whatever NVIDIA is making, yeah. I would not be surprised if those orders are cut and uh, they're able to buy it at a better price. You know, the closest company to NVIDIA uh, AI chips is uh, AMD. AMD. Yeah, and, and they, they are still, been... uh, I would say, months behind, at least a year behind in terms of uh, R&D. Yeah. So there's a good chance that NVIDIA will continue to dominate the market. Yeah. Demand for NVIDIA chips is kind. It's a blue ocean. It's it's just glowing. It's just growing over and over again. Uh, so you uh -huh. can't say that uh, some guys will cancel NVIDIA chips. There is more demand elsewhere. Uh, I'm not saying that people will cancel. Yeah. I think if already we have seen yeah, people canceling is a, is a significant risk. That yeah, you have to accept. Yeah. But and it is not out of the blues. It will not yeah. come out of. It. So for yeah. me, I am not saying that tech stock will fall down. I think. Yeah. Uh, I called the Santa Rally yeah. early enough, yeah. but uh, I will want to see now the sales for this quarter, yes. especially not only just uh, 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 Thanksgiving, Black Friday, yes. and the Tech Monday yeah. from the Adobe. Yeah. I want to see entire festive season, what people get involved with. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, when are you closing your charts? My month? charts, I'm closing them on 28th of December. <laughs> So you're not closing, you just continue. Who closes? Why would I close, Bernard? Why would I do that? May I be going on? Because like I said, I'll be looking to some of the, like this year. Yeah. I don't want to miss on the NVIDIA rally. Yeah. Something, the NVIDIA type of rally. Yeah. So I'll be doing my analysis before I go for the holidays yeah. and then try and see it out. So I'll not close, I'll close my charts on Christmas period, of course. Yeah. Open it on 27th. Yeah. See what's happening. Where I want, I want first to see where the market's closed because that's what I want to do. Yeah. See them close. Yeah. Draft my entries zones and everything. Yeah. My list of, you know, go to companies for 2023. Yeah. Go for New Year, and then we resume a week or two later. <laughs> well, <laughs> for me, yeah. and, um, this is my personal advice to my listeners. Uh, whenever you see markets trading at uh, all-time highs or all-time lows, 
Uh, this is the periods of maximum opportunity in the market. So this is when you have uh, the potential to buy a stock at a really good price or to short a stock at a really high price and you can en- uh, enjoy some really good swings in prices. Uh, if it's happening in currencies and you have multiple yeah, multi-year highs or multi-year lows, uh, those are the areas or levels of maximum opportunity. Uh, I, I remember telling guys this back in 2020 when we had the COVID-19 crash. So I was still doing trainings and I was uh, telling my students, uh, when you see these stocks at these valuations, this is really cheap and this is the period of maximum opportunity. So despite people having extreme fear then, uh, for those who listened, uh, we made some good uh, returns on the way back. And now we are at the other extreme. So in COVID-2020, around March, April, uh, we were trading at all-time lows. And now we are looking at multi-year highs. So the potential for the market changing direction is uh, quite significant and it might present some really good uh, trading opportunities going forward. So as you enjoy your Christmas, uh, make sure to check out the markets, see the overextended ones and uh, plan accordingly. Yeah, definitely. And enjoy your Christmas, guys. Uh, stay safe. Um, um, don't drink and drive. Uh, don't drink and trade. Yes. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you have had a productive year. 2024, make it a bigger year. Uh, going into next year, uh, we'll be looking to improve on the content uh, on the Bullish Banter podcast. So we are encouraging uh, more visitors. So if you are an experienced trader, market analyst, uh, feel free to reach out to, the, to us. We are looking to make the conversation more engaging and rich with content that provides you value every time. Adios. Adios.